Hi guys, um, I am uh, I'm just feeling kind of exhausted this week, so I kept those um, uh, sessions kind of short, like on the extremely short end. Uh, I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, but yeah, so let's let's jump right into questions. I know there are a couple. Um, and this one is really good and, and sort of gets right to the heart of the, the issue. Although the story for this game is occasionally cute or funny and is used to frame many of the puzzles, it seems to be largely cumbersome to the game, where the constant dialogue and exposition just gets in the way of play. Do you think the game would be improved by its removal or extreme simplification? perhaps even beyond the level of the simplicity of Quest for Glory? Would the game be more interesting if, for instance, it was more about abstract interaction with the game's systems, which seems to be the primary element of enjoyment in the game? Um, I, yeah, I think I would agree with that. I, I was really excited about all of the narrative framework um, when we started, uh, because a lot of it is very reminiscent of um, 90s Sierra adventure games in general, like King's Quest and um, even Space Quest, uh, and especially Quest for Glory. Um, but it seems like... Uh, I don't know if it's just the, you know, I'm, I'm, my memory of those games, of playing those games, is colored by nostalgia. Um, or if it's, uh, it is more cumbersome. It feels like there is, there is more extraneous story that is unnecessary. Actually, I mean, I hate to say it, but... I think some of it is the naming. The the names are so unfamiliar to me that I literally have a hard time keeping track of like what is the name of which city uh, versus the name of the forest. Um, I, you know, some of them, the ones that are like major mythological figures uh, or features, I, I know, but anything else like the names of all of the characters i have no idea what the, the characters are named um that i think adds to a level of confusion uh but but there is like an overbearingness to the to the to the plot to the not the plot just the the narrative context all of this exposition all of this framework um the plot itself uh is fine like if if we could just sort of like as you say uh thin out all of the dialogue that sets up the plot and just have like you know it's winter we're gonna have to you know fix the magical winter and in the meantime this kid got kidnapped like let's go save the kid um i think that would work a lot better I think, like, in some ways the game is doing that, is, is, like, directing me in very clear ways, which is fantastic. And is, like, it's, it's clearly a reactionary to uh, Quest for Glory, where you don't have a magic map that shows you where objectives are, and you don't have a notebook that you can take notes in, although I haven't been using it. Um, uh, maybe I should have been. Maybe I should be keeping track of what people's names are. Um, I think that uh, that would improve things. And we're seeing now, like in this last segment, there was no story because I'm so focused on the sim part. Like, I think that there could be, I think there's a couple things. One is that like, there's a way for me to play this where I'm spacing out better exposition and plot points and survival simulation uh and so none of those things are quite as overwhelming as they have been uh because we've been focusing on them pretty much one at a time um 
And the game, I think, has a desired pace. Like, it feels to me playing it like I am, I'm rushing it maybe too much. Uh, and that um, I, I would get more out of it. I'd have more fun um, if I slowed down. If I wasn't trying to, like, rush through all of this stuff that feels very gristy. It feels very like like wandering around for half an hour looking for food. That's not fun. That's not a fun experience for me to share with people. And so I just want to get it over with. Um, whereas if I'm just playing the game by myself, I, this might be the moment when I actually like start over and say, okay, sim game i clearly fucked up the first like that initial run i like i had a bad build order right uh and um i i gotta i gotta maybe restat my character just a little bit uh and focus on finding food way earlier um there's also this is also like not uncommon to to quest for glory games Oh God, I'm just gonna I'm gonna tell stories this whole time. I think. Okay, so um, uh, it's not uncommon for Quest for Glory games for there to be there. Are, there are a lot of embedded systems that are not forefronted, and this game forefronts some stuff more than other Quest for Glory games have. Um, it also opens up. No, that's not even true. God, it's so hard for me to remember experiencing Quest for Glory 1 for the first time. Because I've played it so many times, knowing what the plot is, knowing what, you know, if not the optimal, then at least like what the basic systems are uh, in the world. I'm thinking, for example, about, uh, uh, like I said, you can grind on money. Um, there's a... a Outside of the town, if you go the right way, there's the healer's cabin, and uh, the healer wants flowers. Uh, and there are there's a very simple path to get to the garden where there are flowers. And if you know that the healer is the first place you should go, and then uh, you know how to get to the flowers, you can do like three or four trips a day where you earn, I think, 10 silver every trip, something like that. Um, so y you can get like 30 or 40 silver, three or four gold every day that you spend doing that. And uh, you can like optimize your build so that you're also upping stats while you do that and learning how to fight and doing these other things. You can go into the castle and uh, get a job um, in the stables, which ups your strength and pays you some money and gives you a free place to rest and a free meal. So like, if you know that and you know that you have to be there at a certain time of day in order to get that job, then it becomes super easy to survive in that world because I, you know, you just spend your first few days running back and forth and getting flowers and then uh, keeping an eye on the clock and when the time is right, going into the stable and working in the stable. And then you're set, like it's super easy. Um, I, I bet those things exist in this game too. I just don't know what they are. I haven't played the game. And, and there's nothing that Quest for Glory does especially well that tells you what those things are. You just have to find them, and then once you've found them, hope that it's not too late for you, and quite possibly, like, start your game over uh, with that knowledge. Um, which it strikes me now is a very, like, 90s mentality towards playing games. Um, Heroine's Quest seems to accomplish uh, actually embodying that mentality uh where you know you don't the game does not it the game doesn't doesn't um the game expects you to explore 
and expects you to fail while you are exploring. Uh, and you are not going to succeed at the game until you have failed hard a number of times uh, and started over from scratch with a new strategy uh, and and new and knowledge that that comes from previous plays of the game. Yeah, um, which is in a lot of ways not super fun for me i mean uh it's it's not how i normally engage with games and it's certainly not how i've engaged with any of the quest for glory games since they came out uh so it's a very different experience um it's something that i am super interested in and i i think because i care about quest for glory i am interested in continuing to play this game and I will probably do it uh, but I might do it on my own time I think what I'll do is I'll put up a straw poll to see uh, if people are interested in continuing this game um, or moving on to something else um, which would be fine with me uh, I feel like we've given it a, f a fair shake um, uh, and then it would be a, a game that I could sort of just play some more uh and report back on i guess um but i think it's interesting that like uh, part of it maybe that i'm trying to play it in a style like you might play a game like uh well like king's quest honestly or even more so like broken age or uh, monkey island or something where um you know the the game at the very least is waiting for you uh, so, um, you can fuck up continually, but there's no element of strategy. And there's certainly, I mean, this is a game that's about strategy, but it's also about, like, knowing the field of play so that you can optimize it. And this is very true of all Quest for Glory games. Uh, I, this game is helping me realize, um, that there are games that are very much about... Uh, you know, memorizing the combos. Uh, they're about sort of knowing what is ahead of you at least a little bit so that you can do the right thing to prepare for at least, I think, these first few days. It's important to, like, know the people that you're supposed to talk to and know how to pace things out um, because otherwise you're just going to, like, starve cold and alone in the woods at night eaten by trolls. Um, I went way off on tangent there, but um, uh, I, the original question was about uh, paring down the story, and yeah, I think the game would benefit from paring down the story, uh, as well as, you know, maybe just having a different style of play. Um... Uh, explicitly the question is there going to be another session of this game I'll leave that up to people at least for this next um, week uh, if people are interested in seeing where this goes either seeing where this goes or um, uh, maybe the other option would be uh, starting a new character um, and, uh, and trying to play a little bit smarter or a little bit more knowledgeable um, and see how that goes and skipping through literally all of the dialogue. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, do you feel that the game may be too attached to its quest for glory heritage and in keeping with so many of its outdated systems without iterating or improving upon them, it's more difficult to enjoy now. Would it benefit from some modernization or is the archaicness of its systems part of the enjoyment? So this is a, this is a super interesting question that gets into a much larger debate um, that I think is part of the, I, I don't know if we'll talk about this in Broken Age, um, but I, there's the potential for us to, to talk more about this on Monday. Um, my impression of Broken Age is that uh, I haven't played Act 2 yet. We haven't done any of, of um, Act 2. Act 2 is 
gotten really much lower critical praise than uh, the first act. I've enjoyed the first act immensely. But I get this sense that um, the first act received some backlash from hardcore adventure game fans who felt like uh, Double Fine had promised them uh, an adventure game in the old style, a 90s style adventure game. And um, Broken Age is too smooth. It doesn't have, it's not hard enough. Uh, it, it doesn't have these jagged edges and, and spikes in difficulty uh, that um, you would hit your head against. It's, which I love. I love how smooth it is. I think it's fantastic. Um, and then uh, Act 2 may have been an overcompensation. Uh, I'm saying this again without having actually played it, so I don't know if that's the case, but uh, Act 2 may have been an overcompensation against those complaints, um, and it ended up not fitting really well uh, together. Um, I feel like Heroine's Quest is the opposite approach this this is what it looks like to actually make a game in the style of the 90s game that it is paying homage to um and I, for better or for worse uh, i mean for for all that that means uh it is um a lot closer to the actual experience of playing a 90s adventure game. So anybody who was pining for that and complaining that modern adventure games don't deliver, um, this is the game. This, I think that this game is delivering. Uh, but bottom line, I think that games have evolved away from that for really good reasons. Uh, and so, if you do not have a strong nostalgic connection to that style of game, then this game is not going to be as fun. It's not going to like. It's not going to work as well for you uh, as a more updated game, a game that has like more modern systems. Um, that's you know that's. Oh, that's smoother uh, however that actually gets accomplished for me um, I'm I'm in this really interesting position where uh, this is not how I typically enjoy playing games like I'm not into getting frustrated and I'm not into um, you know, a, a game that would, for example, make me start over and try a new strategy. That's not true. I really, I liked doing that with XCOM. Hmm. So maybe, I, you know, for the same reasons that I loved Quest for Glory, even though it's been a long time since I actually had that experience with Quest for Glory, this still kind of pushes the same buttons for me uh, and certainly the nostalgic connection I have to that property uh, is does a lot to pull me along so I am super into playing this game more um, on my own uh, but it it is it feels like a throwback this does not feel like a game that was made in 2015 uh, this feels like, you know, it's, uh, it feels like somebody played Quest for Glory in 1994 or two or whenever, yeah, that was 89, 91, maybe. So, uh, the original was 89 and then the remake was 91. I think it's something like that. So then in like 1993 made, uh, uh, an updated copy of, uh, the hero's quest mechanics and um, and threw in some more simulation stuff uh, and you know called that a day but it, it it feels like a 20 year old game um, uh
Are you um, are you only considering old school adventure games regarding your comparisons during story times? Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm obviously drawing a lot from old school adventure games. Uh, because that is the heritage of this game, um, uh, the, at least the direct heritage, and I think like deliberately that that is what its genetic code comes from. It's also that's what I played in the '90s, so I'm not I'm not sure what alternatives you are suggesting. Um, uh, would make interesting com other comparisons. Um, but other games that are contemporary to the feel of this game, so other games from 1995, um, I didn't, I, I mean, I didn't play, I, that's, I played Quest for Glory. I played the Sierra games. Uh, I played, um, you know, Betrayal at Crondor. Uh, and, and a couple other RPGs, maybe. Um, yeah, I, so I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think, yes, I am sort of very focused on old school adventure games, but I think that, that uh, that's, there's a, there's a motivation for that. Um, uh, the, uh, Cage Tiger suggests that this game is um, Don't Starve with a Story. Uh, wow, yeah, I, yeah, uh, I'm having trouble with that because, like, there's this, there's this clearly very don't starve bit that is a survival sim. And it is, it's don't starve light, right? Because there's no crafting and there's no, like, exploring procedural environments. It's just, you know, it's just finding the bushes that you can gather food from. Um, it's, it's an extremely light version of don't starve. Uh, and then the story, I mean, I, yeah, I guess it's don't starve with the story. When you say that, the story seems exceptionally overwrought. But I think there's also like a middle bit where um, it's there's there's an adventure game in there too uh, that isn't just like let's throw piles of exposition onto Don't Starve, right? That that um, there is at least the potential for some really interesting characters and. Uh, and some really interesting plot that involves those characters that you sort of uncover and engage with. And so far, this game, I feel like, isn't living up to that the way that I want it to. The way that, like, when I think about one of the Quest for Glory games, and I think about how much I cared about some of those characters, um, I... I'm not getting that from any of the characters in this game. And and I feel like I've just barely started touching the the plots, the stories that involve them that like I'm actually going to do stuff with. Um but I still I, I I don't know. It feels like there's potential there that's that's going untapped. Uh and so I can see how it feels like it's just it's just a survival stim with uh, with a ton of exposition on it, um, but I think it has the potential to be a lot more than that. And I don't know that you're actually intending that to be as dismissive as I'm making it, but um, when you ask the question that way, it makes me realize that you know, in some ways, uh, the game is is failing on that count. Um, How would you fix the town's economy so fewer heroines starved in the future? Uh, I, I, so I really like what Quest for Glory 1 did, 
where it put in front of you what I think of as very clearly, although I'm thinking about it, I don't know that it is very clear until you know it, and then it's obvious, uh, but you have to like play it or look at a, a, a walkthrough to actually know what to do. Um, uh, having a fetch quest, having a like recurring fetch quest that you can always do in order to get gold, having a place that you can, the, the game gives us a place where we can sleep for free, which is great. Uh, it gives us like enough place, it gives us a couple places we can sleep for free. Um, but I feel like it also really needs to give us a place that we can eat for free. And maybe that's inconvenient, uh, which is sort of how Quest for Glory 1 did it. But, um, I, you know, there should be a way for me to not starve. Um, that's what I really want. I really want, like, very accessible. And I, I would... I feel like with the amount that this game has done to point me towards stuff that I need to know, uh, I feel like the game should be pointing me really hard towards those two things because they're they're just basic to my survival. They're basic to me being able to get through the rest of the things in the game. Um, are there similarities between how you feel at this point in Heroine's Quest and the point of the game where mostly walking stopped quest for glory yeah i'm i'm super worried that this is no fun for anybody but me and i'm uh i'm worried that you know it's less fun than it should be for me because i'm uh i'm i'm not playing it the way that i would play it if i was playing it on my own so um uh which that's very similar on the other hand i'm sort of I'm, there's a, I'm in a lot of ways delighted by this game, and that's why uh, it's frustrating for me to feel like I'm hitting my head against it, and, and I'm like trying to rush through it, and it's not being fun, because I am secretly delighted to be playing a Quest for Glory game for the first time again. I, I literally don't remember ever doing that. It was so long ago... Uh, I could play Quest for Glory 5, and I actually don't really know that game, but, um, but I also don't really like that game. The, but the, the, the Quest for Glory games that I grew up on, like, I played so long ago that I don't remember playing them for the first time. So it's very exciting for me to, to have that experience, and it's frustrating for me that I can't make that excitement come across the way that I want to. Um... <laughs> um, Cage Tiger is asking so many really good questions. All right. Um, are you sure that rather than playing this game, you wouldn't prefer to just be playing Quest for Glory again? It seems like most of the things we're finding fault with are the ways in which it's different from Quest for Glory. Um... I am, I am admittedly obsessed with the experience difference between this and Quest for Glory, 100%. But my experience of Quest for Glory is, um, is, a, is a game that I've played 100 times, that I, that I know all the secrets of. Uh, and, um, and like I say, there's actually something kind of magical for me to be discovering those things for the first time. Um, and I think that if I was playing at a different pace uh, and I was more open to the idea of, for example, like exploring the whole map with a death wish and then starting the game over with a little bit more foreknowledge, um, that uh, I think that I am actually personally getting something out of this game. Um, but you are not wrong to make that observation. Uh, yeah. So I I can't remember if I told this story back when we played Quest for Glory, and um, this Q and A is going on long, so I might just uh, <laughs> I might just um, 
uh, tell this story and then wrap up. But uh, part part and parcel to my experience, my entire sort of like embodied experience of Quest for Glory, the, the, the whole series. Um, I mean, I, I played them at one point uh, for the first time, and I've played them a hundred times since then, and, and that's, that's all part of it. But there's also um, one of the most influential artifacts uh, in my journey towards being involved in game design and, uh, and, and honestly my love of games is the official uh, Quest for Glory walkthrough, which is a, I actually just sort of found my copy the other day. Uh, it's a big purple book uh, that, um, it's a walkthrough, it's a guide to the first four Quest for Glory games. Um, and it is written narratively. It is written as a story told from the perspective of the character who is doing everything that right, who's playing the game semi-optimally. Um, so it's a it's a book that so not only did I play these games a hundred times, I've also read that book a hundred times uh, because it it presents as a story like you can you can actually read it and it is a narrative it's not just like a list of maps uh and uh and objectives it's not like a typical walkthrough it is it's a it's a it's a novel it's a novel it's a novelization of the strategy of quest for glory games um and so like when I say that I when I play a Quest for Glory game, I am going into it with an enormous amount of foreknowledge. It's not just because I've played it a million times. It's it's also because I like I know the book, I know the story, and when I think about the story of Quest for Glory, I it's all mixed up in my head with this actual like novelization narrative. Um, which gives me a very strange perspective, I think, on those games. And, and it really, really affects the nostalgia that I have for them. Um, and so this game is fascinating to me as something that I have not yet had any of those experiences with. Um, as much as I compare as much as I say that, you know, this game is just like Quest for Glory, it's incredible to me how different my experience of it is from any experience that I can remember having with Quest for Glory. And I, I think that's actually really kind of... Uh, there's something there's something incredible about that that's that is probably an experience that i'll never have again because i i mean i can't imagine that anybody's ever going to make another quest for glory game um or at least you know another game in the style of the original quest for glory I, I, this is probably the only one um so in my adult life this is the only opportunity that i'm going to have to to actually experience that thing uh, that is the original experience of the thing that I loved as a kid. It also, I mean, you know, that nostalgia is an extremely powerful force. And the stories that we tell ourselves around the things that we did and loved as children are incredibly powerful. Uh, and so when I look at like, you know, Sony's E3 press conference this year that was all about hearkening back to the properties that people loved 10, 20 years ago, not 20 years ago, but 10 years ago, right? Five, 10 years ago. Um, it's interesting for me to see that as an outsider because I did not personally love any of those properties. 
uh, but I can understand. I mean, Quest for Glory is my understanding of what effect that has on people and why people get so excited and so caught up. Um, uh, and even when, as an outsider, I, 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 the I can't imagine, I literally can't imagine how they can do a remake of Final Fantasy VII and not screw it up. Uh... I, I think that people will play it. I mean, I think that there's definitely a way that they can do it. I mean, they could screw it up, but there's a way that they could make it where people will play it and love it uh, because it's a remake of Final Fantasy VII, and that's all it needs to be. Uh, and I think that um, I can see like some very, very clear faults in the writing, especially the character writing, but in a lot of the expository writing for Heroine's Quest as well. Um, but it's also easy for me to love it, I think, because of how connected it is to, to Quest for Glory. Um, and the one other question that I don't actually see here uh, was something about... Um, was the do I did, was this a, a game that was necessary? Was this does this fill actually a void, um, or was it a, a, a cash grab? Um, it's certainly not a cash grab uh, because it's free. It's free on Steam. Um, if you have any interest in uh, you know reliving the actual experience of '90s adventure games, then um, uh, check it out. Uh, free on Steam. Um, it fills a void for me. Um, like I say, this is a unique experience for me that I don't think I'll have any oppor an opportunity anywhere else to have. Um, but the people who played Quest for Glory were a much smaller audience than the people who played King's Quest. Um, it was a it was a niche game. And I'm not 100% sure why, because it seems to me like it, um, it should have really bridged the adventure game and RPG audiences, uh, but it didn't. It, it was very niche. Uh, so I think there's not a lot of people for whom this game actually fills a void. Uh, I think that for a lot of people, it's probably an extraneous uh, piece of software. And uh, maybe... Uh, Crystal Shard couldn't have gotten away with charging for it. Um, maybe there just wouldn't have been an audience there. Um, but regardless, I feel like it was made out of love. Uh, and that comes across to me. And it was also made on a budget. And, you know, I, th I think that if they had had infinite production resources, there are things that they could have done to drastically improve it. Uh, but they clearly focused on the things that they thought were important for making an homage to Quest for Glory, and uh, I think they succeeded in sort of um, uh, hitting the points that were going to be important to other Quest for Glory fans. Um, Final Fantasy VII was originally 1997, nearly 20 years ago. Wow, that's amazing. Um... Okay, thanks guys. Uh, I'll put up a straw poll uh, on Twitter uh, at some point with some like, what are we gonna do from here uh, ideas and, and you know, whatever, we'll figure it out. Um, let me just real quick remind everybody, uh, actually I don't know what the schedule is gonna be this week because Saturday is the 4th of July. Um, Cage Tiger may or may not be streaming. Um, Bill, I guess, is, is usually streams on Sunday. So Cage Tiger maybe is continuing Final Fantasy VI on uh, Saturday at 8 o'clock. Um, Bill Grainer uh, usually streams Sundays at 6 o'clock. Sunday Game Club with Thenarod, uh, still playing Kingdom Hearts, I believe. Um, Sunday at 8 o'clock, uh, and there is a new Feedback Force podcast out this week, 
Um, check it out. Uh, the the game that it is discussing is Rus. Uh, and um, the next game for two weeks from now is Beyond Good and Evil, uh, which is another like formative game for me. Uh, so I'm really excited about that, uh, and hopefully I'll have a chance to participate in it. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, check out, uh, follow me on Twitter f for for up to date information, schedule stuff. Uh, and straw polls and um, I'll be back uh, next week, next Wednesday um, doing something. Uh, regardless it'll be fun, I promise that. Uh, thanks for sticking around guys. Thanks for watching uh, and I'll see you next week. Have a good night. <laughs>